Thank you so much for clicking on this video of A Care Collab with Brasavola Plagiaralis. Really appreciate your time and your interest. Let me just ask you, are you familiar with Antonio Musa Brasavola? Because the genus was named after him. Now, if you're not familiar with Antonio Musa Brasavola, maybe you're familiar with Apartment Life Orchids, TD More Than Just Orchids, and Todd's Tropicals. Let me just direct you to the description below because they also have and grow Brasavola flagellaris, and their videos will be in the description for you to have a look-see as to how they grow them, especially seeing as my grow method may be a little bit unconventional and not for everybody. But let's get back to Antonio Musa Brasavola because the genus is actually named after him. And again, if you're not familiar with him, that is probably because he was around in the 1500s to 1555. The other channels I've just mentioned, the other growers, they're still around. And <laughs> one great thing about this Care Collab is that Todd's Tropicals Brasavola is actually in bloom. And I want to thank him so very much for giving me the heads up that his is in bloom to coordinate a quick Care Collab and everybody that is joining in today, thank you for your quick and fast response. As you can see, my Brasavola flageralis this year is not in bloom. What a shame, I missed out. Last year she did bloom for me. Very beautiful, beautiful, plain, simple looking bloom, super fragrant at night and very long lasting, even in the heat of my Southern Spanish climate, which is amazing considering how delicate these blooms are but how they are able to withstand the conditions they have to tolerate. My summers can go up to 40 degrees Celsius or above, but it's not like I have a lot of humidity to balance those conditions. Unfortunately, my humidity averages about 20 to 30% during the months of May throughout September. Today, I have 61% humidity, and this is a great day for my Brasavola flageralis because this is what she likes. 60 to 80 percent humidity all year round because she is a warm to hot grower up to 800 meters. I'm at sea level but I have an extremely dry dry climate and I don't have any rain to speak of for the months of May throughout September but I have very very hot dry winds. So what you're seeing here is my attempt at growing this orchid successfully based on those super dry conditions. The other side of the spectrum, she can tolerate temperatures down to 10 degrees Celsius and less if it's not for an extended period of time. So I actually have her outside until such a time that my temperatures drop below 10 degrees Celsius and she lives exactly where we have her right now all year round. We are now facing east. So her back is to the light. To the right of the orchid is south and the angle of the sun determines how much light she gets. I very, very rarely move her, and I move her even less now because she's growing roots up the trellis. I'm not sure if that top one is attached, but I'm not going to touch it until such a time that it's grown beyond the trellis because Brasavola roots have this fantastic, fantastic quirk, which is extremely annoying, that as the new roots come, they do not absorb any water, and is up to the back roots to do all the work. Brasavola also have roots that they dump on occasions for no other reasons but they're replenishing a new root system. So what's the point of holding on to something old? At least in my climate, that is the phenomenon that I have. And it's something I have to deal with. And because I'm trying to get away from any form of organic growing, having to change sphagnum moss, in my climate, I would have to water the sphagnum moss every day, several times a day, just like I do with what I've got mounted now and how I have it mounted. And that makes sphagnum moss degrade extremely quickly and Brasavola roots would deteriorate the moment the media gets too acidic. So in my quest to grow inorganically, I'm using hop filter material, which is very, very water retentive. It is sort of the cheap version of EpiWeb, it's also a little bit more flexible. And you can see that the roots actually have no problem going into the material and finding their way through. Now the whole mount as well has a little bit of a back pocket, back layer of hob material because there's roots in there that are being kept nice and humid. And 
uh, <clears throat> to some degree also growing out. That's fine. As long as I have like 80% of a root that is functioning and absorbing water in the hob material, this orchid is doing very, very well. And I don't have to be so radical on the misting on a daily basis, with the exception of when the hot and dry winds come, because I really would like to maintain these gorgeous root tips here. They are not going to find themselves in the hob material anytime soon, if ever, even when they start to absorb water. Brasavola roots are extremely stiff. They don't bend easily. I couldn't like manipulate them to curve them towards the hob material. So if they don't do it of their own, like that one right there, going in nicely, the other ones will always remain aerial. Eventually the root tips will stop growing. And it is to my understanding and my experience that once the root tip stops growing on a Brasavola orchid, that is when it starts to absorb water. While it is an act of growth, no matter how long, they will repel water. Let me show you. This is what I do on the daily. Misting, misting, misting. And because I can do that quite heavily with my hob material in the background, finally, I've got enough humidity around this orchid that the roots are getting longer and extending before they shut down and don't manage to get into the hob material. But you can see how the new roots are just repelling that water as if it's got some kind of Teflon on it. So I have no chance of growing this orchid in the conventional way with sphagnum moss unless I change the sphagnum moss every six months, disturb a brassavola root, it will stop growing or it will die. Very, very finicky, I find the root system as such. And of course, there are other ways to grow this orchid. I could pot it up. However, being my first Brasavola orchid when I got her back in 2018, I was learning about her. So I put her into an orchid top with ceramics. She didn't like that at all. I almost lost her. So I mounted her on what was the first mount, which is this grading here that you see like with the Mercedes pattern. That was her first mount and I had sphagnum moss on that. And that worked all right for the first year of 2019 that she had to endure a summer with me. But as the orchid grew, it clearly was not going to be enough because the size of the orchid makes it more demanding. So in the summer of 2020, the whole concept of inorganic growing came to my mind thanks to a genius idea of Michael McCarthy. We were discussing another orchid and he said to use a scrubby pad as opposed to EpiWeb because EpiWeb is super expensive. And from the scrubby pad, I then found the hob material and I thought that is the next alternative to sphagnum moss because it's much more fluffier and forgiving and its structure is a little bit more adaptable to certain forms and shapes. Scrubby pads tend to be relatively stiff. Long story short, this is the mount on a mount now. As from 2020, I just mounted what was there before, took off the sphagnum moss and mounted it on a grid on the back. I added the hob material and then I added that additional pocket in the back that we saw earlier to give the roots air but humidity. This way I am hoping to keep her happy and so far despite the fact that I don't have blooms this year she has given me plenty of new growths. I've got four new growths that have matured and the fifth one is right here there's another one coming out. So she is growing well, and that's all I can really ask at this point in time. And her roots have never been as long as this in my time with her. They have not managed to hold on. They always used to fail too soon. And I'm really pleased that the humidity, this little microclimate around the orchid is making it possible for her to grow strong with a load of roots. Maybe next year we'll get a flush of bloom. Now, in my season this year in 2021, I am about five weeks behind of any form of development of my orchids. I can recognize that we had a very, very mild spring, so everything kicked into action late. But you can see I pulled a sheath back here just to see if there would be a spike in one of the mature growths up here, but there's not this sheath right now. We can pull it back and have a look-see. I'm always reluctant to do this because, oh, but look, 
I was just saying I'm always reluctant to do this because she's are there for a reason. But yay, can you see that? Let me get in there. Oh, we are going to get blooms. I was just saying I am five weeks behind this year due to a mild spring. But you whoop de do. Look at that. Right. That was a cool one. I just never wanted to peel this one back because I was disappointed there was nothing in the top one here. But hey, we will see her bloom. They're very, very gorgeous, very beautifully fragrant at night. So there's something to look forward to there. That's wonderful. Anyway, fertilizer, as you can see, when the new roots develop and they just repel the water like Teflon, there's really no point in fertilizing these roots at all, avoiding any kind of mineral buildup on them. When it's hot and windy, that water evaporates very fast. So my focus basically is to keep the roots that are absorbing the water in the back here, keep them fertilized. And I am very, very conservative about that as well. I try to stick to 100 parts per million because I do not want to kill off any roots that are actually absorbing nutrients. If that happens, then I'm done for because these guys aren't ready yet. 100 parts per million, it's pretty much my go-to every day and every day in the morning as well prior to it getting too hot in the summer. And then during the day, as you just saw, I go around misting one more time with the plain RO water, sometimes two or three times if the hot winds are at their worst. But round about eight o'clock in the morning, there's a hundred parts per million that she can take up and absorb. Around about noon, I go about and try to flush any excesses off by using plain RO water. And then it depends on the day whether I need to go around one more time. And if I have to, towards the evening, that I don't want to be around the crown or the rhizome of any of the growth, I missed her from behind. I go behind the trellis and I just missed the pocket that's in the back here, keeping that nice and damp. So in the winter, when the angle of the sun drops far enough, it will come in straight at her from this direction. Those are the months from about December through to March. That's when she will get direct sunlight and you can see there is some scorching here when that happens. But it's a gradual adjustment and if she gets too much anthocyanin and I find her a little bit too red, I will move her back a bit, as in back behind us in my blooming alley where she will not be exposed to direct sun. Basically, I rarely, rarely move her. If the temperatures drop below 10 degrees Celsius, which happens around December, January, that's the coldest part of my year, I do take her inside. I have a rack that are very close to some shop lights and that's where I hang her. But again, facing away from the shop lights, that's then where she spends the night on the nights that are below 10 degrees Celsius. But normally she lives here all year round. I don't have much fuss with this orchid. Now that, she has her microclimate all set up and dialed in. And we're gonna get some blooms. <laughs> Super exciting. I'm really glad that I did check in the end. I'm just hoping that it hasn't bent in too much, which can also happen with Brassavola spikes when there's not enough humidity around. Let's not be overly, overly happy but at least it tried. If it doesn't bloom, at least it tried. So yeah, Antonio Musa Brassavola, physician and botanist. In honor of him, we have this gorgeous genus. And now that I've figured out its little quirks, I'm quite happy to, to say that I haven't killed it. It was a close call in 2018 when I got her. I'm not entirely sure if I've covered everything. And if I haven't, and you would like me to clarify something, please leave that in the comments below. Very much appreciate your time. Very much appreciate apartment life orchids, tots, tropicals, and TD more than just orchids as well for jumping on board. And let's go and have a look, see what their Brassavola flagellaris is doing, especially tods. We are going to see some bloom in this series. Thank you for watching my video. Hope that you found this useful, and I hope to see you in the next video as well. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe and take care. Bye.